Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Geomologist Presents. Hope you're having a great day. So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, first off, we have a call-in from GM Shadow of A Song of Ice and Shadow podcast. And he talks about the box sets and the box set uh, podcast that I put out last week. It actually was cool. It kind of generated some interesting conversation on a couple of discords. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, I might look at some of the highlights there and then kind of talk about a little bit after we hear Barry's comment, talk a little bit about some of the cool starter sets. Well, not box sets, but starter sets that uh, Chaosium has been putting out. And those include the RuneQuest box set, the Pendragon box set, and the Call of Cthulhu starter set as well so i'll probably just focus on the pendragon starter set and tell you because they all have the same format um so i'll talk a little bit about that one and then i'll dive into the main topic of the show which is kind of my ongoing game update so the games that i've been playing for quite a while that are more or less campaign in nature what's going on with them how are they become sustainable are they at working and when do i plan to end them so right it's not going to talk about one shots or convention style games though those can you know one shot or convention style game can lead to something which would kind of be cool and i have an idea for doing that at north texas rpg con but these are going to be the games that i've been playing like i said for some time and these would include warhammer fantasy twilight 2000 r2 pathfinder 2 games and our ongoing Traveler game. So i really not going to count the new Blood Lords Pathfinder 2 game because, well, we just started it. And these other games have been going on for at least a year, if not longer. So, uh, yeah, we'll talk about them. Anyway, let's get to Barry's call. Hi Carl, it's Barry here again from A Song of Dice and Shadows. I uh, just listened to your most recent episode about starter sets and to answer the question in the title, I do like starter sets. Um, didn't think I did, but I've used a few recently and discovered I do quite enjoy um, them. I know so much about maybe the recent D&D ones, but certainly my older D&D one that I've got the black box. And I'm really keen to get my hands on some Free League starter sets as well because, you know, with looking at some of the ones and some of the Free League games look pretty cool actually, it'd be quite good to get it. Um, other thing I was ringing about is Wrath and Glory. So I've not managed to get Wrath and Glory to the table because I'm distracted by everything else that I've got. But I did buy the PDFs on a bundle. Uh, I think it was Humble Bundle or one bag of bundle of holding. Can't remember which one now. But they did a bundle for the PDFs. Um, I would say though that if you're interested in it and you've not run it, it might be worth checking out if you're interested. Uh, there is a podcast technically, but it's on YouTube called Wrath and Story, which I really enjoyed listening to when I was thinking about running it. Um, it's a little bit crazy, but it's done, um, most of it's done in character, but they do the sort of central conceit being that you're seeing their adventures through the, like a servo skull that's recording it, but the servo skull is using the Wrath and Glory role-playing game system as a way of kind of like showing you what's happening through words, which is a bit weird, but somewhat fun kind of thing. It's a little bit madcap, but you do actually get a good sense, I think, of how the game system works by listening to it. So yeah, I just thought I'd kind of throw it out there if you're interested. Um, um, I don't always enjoy actual plays, but that one was a bit entertaining, I found, and also quite educational on how the game runs. So yeah, just thought I'd suggest it anyway. So take care, Carl, and I'll speak to you again soon. Cool. Thank you so much, Barry, for that call. Yeah, you know, I'm glad that you enjoy starter sets. There, I guess we have to categorize things or define things. So starter sets are kind of focused for beginning players in that system as opposed to box sets, another term that was thrown out in the Discord discussion, where box sets kind of hearken to the old sort of TSR box sets that were kind of a complete game or a complete world. Not necessarily a complete game, right, if you have the Dark Sun or the um, old Planescape type box sets, but the Moldway Basic or the Holmes Basic or the other Basic 
which is the Menser basic, right? Those, and then of course the uh, expert sets as well. So, um, and then when you have Beck me, then you have basic expert companion, and then the M and the I. More, I know I is immortal, but uh, M is master. There you go. M is master. Oh, you just got to look on Google or not Google wiki for that kind of stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, so, but these are starter sets. So games that, um, you know, like I said, entry into the game and they're actually pretty good. They vary. I would say they vary in quality and what they give you. Uh, another box that I'm looking at is the ring world box set from Chaosium from back in the eighties as well. Um, Another box set, which is a complete adventure, is the Music of the Spheres box set by um, for Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, but then you have like the Fall and uh, Night Below, another box set. I'm just looking. But then you have like I'm looking at the One Ring, Dragon Bane, um, Walking Dead, Alien. Those are the Free League box sets. I have Tales from the Loop box set as well. And actually, the Twilight Two Thousand is. Well, so those were starter sets, but Twilight 2000 is actually, in fact, a box set because it is a complete game. So that's kind of interesting. But I would say the Tales from the Loop starter sets are pretty good, right? One comment was, oh, well, you don't have the complete game. But in effect, I mean, you don't have, in the box sets, they have, like, a rule book, usually, the Free League ones specifically I'm talking about. And they have all the rules you need for play. They do not have character creation or like the world fluff. Those are in the main book and GM advice and things like that. But it's kind of a player's book and it's great at the table. I've used it at the table as a second a supplementary rule book because it has like the rules for combat, the rules for the exploration or skills are all in there, etc. So it, it's, it worked really well, especially when I ran... Uh, the Chariot of the Gods adventure from the Alien starter set. And I had my main rule book, and we shared uh, that extra rule book at the table. It was easier to hand around. So, And it has the same rules, uh, which is kind of interesting. Again, no character creation or world lore, but you don't really need those at the table, right? So, all right, well, let's check out, one of, like I said, one of these Chaosium starter sets. Okay, first off, the Pendragon starter set is a beautiful book. It's got Greg Stafford's name on it. It has a Pendragon logo, uh, the gold crown on the blue field, the Pendragon script. And it has a really interesting, a cool picture on the cover. Hopefully I can find out who did the cover of the box set. So it looks like the cover art is by Andre Festov, who apparently is given credit for the cover arts of all the other three books that are in here. So what's in the box? They actually give you like a one-page handout for what's in the box. Three books. Book one, The Adventure of the Sword and Stone. Book two, The Fabled Realm. And book three, The Sword Campaign. They have four appendices, additional rule settings, which introduce as you play. Pre-generated characters, so eight player knights, each newly knighted and ready for adventure. Battle cards, 18 cards detailing encounters and opportunities for player knights to face in battle. And dice. They have a set of dice, a d20, and six D6s that you would need. So that's kind of a nice little feature that they have like that's in the box. So let's look at these books. Book one, The Adventure of the Sword in the Stone. And what it's kind of neat, and I think what sets apart these Chaosium box sets is that they have a solo quest specifically designed to teach the rules of the game and introduce the legendary world of Pendragon. And this is probably something I might do as a follow-up and just do the solo quest. It's been a long time since I played Pendragon. This is the sixth edition of the rule set. I think I started playing, I want to say, I don't, I want to say second edition. I might have some second edition books that I have, but mainly I played the third edition of it. And there are some other editions. I have the Five and five point whatever is as well. Um, I think I do have the fourth edition book too. Um, I probably wasn't in there in first edition. I think that was an actual box set in the Chaosium style at the time. But I definitely have some second edition stuff 
Um, so I have to look in my collection. I know I have some second edition adventures. Uh, famously, the Grey Knight is one of those, and the Tournament of Dreams, another that I think they've redone. Uh, so I've been with Pendragon for a while. We did ran, run a long term campaign. And if you listen to mine or Joe Richter's uh, podcast, Hindsightless, you will see that I have I had a big kaboom at the end of one of these Pendragon campaigns. A sip of coffee there. So, anyway, so that's kind of neat that they have a solo quest to help you learn the game. Um, it's kind of a choose your own thing, and all of the so both the Rune Quest and the Call of Cthulhu have that as well. Um, the Call of Cthulhu will have like an alone against, I think it's alone against the, the swamp or something like that that they have in the box set. I could be wrong, but they, I love the alone against, they're really fun. I need to jump back to that. I think I did Alone Against the Flames as a podcast a while back. Maybe I'll try to do some of these others. Anyway, fun solo stuff. Then book two is the six edition rules and setting. So this is curious. So what do they have in here? The game system, traits and passion, skills, honor and glory, combat, arms and armor, horses, injury and death, wealth and treasure. Again, um, and they give you sort of all the terminology of what happens, how to get experience. So again, everything but the character creation. And character creation is definitely, from what I recall, involved in Pendragon. Uh, you have um, uh, right, so a life path type system. So, um, so I think that's what they have. They have on the back. They have a on the back of the actual. I didn't see what they have on the back of, this, of the first adventure, but on the back of this book, they have like a really cool um, poetic map of Cumbria. Uh, so, and on the back of the Sword and the Stone adventure, they have a poetic map of the North. I guess you can put these together. I put these together. They are contiguous. Uh, Potentially. Oh yeah, there's Garloth. Yep. So you could put these together, overlap them, uh, which is interesting. So, um, so that's uh, those two books, and then finally the third book is the Sword Campaign, and on the back it has Logris, so the heartland of uh, Arthur's realm. That's a really nice poetic map. I wonder. If they, do they have a big map in here? Oh, they're missing a big map in here. That is a lost opportunity, in my opinion. Um, any case, so the, the sword campaign, it kind of starts with the adventure of the sword tournament. And, um, and then it does a winter phase. It looks like it does at least one winter phase. So it's a, is it maybe a two-year campaign? They give you like an introduction and a literary timeline. And what is it? Uh, your Pendragon will vary. That's kind of a nice little, um, right? So your Pendragon will vary depending if you use Lamord of Arthur, Mist of Avalon, etc. The Warlord Chronicles. Um, and uh, yeah, for Game Masters only, running the scenarios. So that's kind of cool. So how do they do the tournament? And they tell you, is it supposed to be a scenario time? Quick narrative time, tracking time, how to do that. I think it's a two-year campaign. Oh, it says a... Did it, say, did it say a six-year campaign? Detailed five-year camp, five-year campaign. Wow. Okay. Five-year campaign. That's pretty crazy. That you could do a five-year campaign. So they have the Adventure of the Sword Tournament, the Adventure of the Forest of the Silver Deer, the Adventure of the Broken Sword, and then how to do further adventures as well. But they do. They go through at least one winter phase with you, which is kind of nice. Winter phase being sort of the downtime when you got to take care of your land as a man or lord. So yeah, it's a pretty nice set. So that's those are the three books I've told you. And then you can see what we got: the appendices. They have battle, how to run a battle, tournaments, how to run tournaments, um, overland movement, a separate appendix for that, visiting a foreign court, which is kind of nice. So uh, that is. Four appendices, and then they have some cards that are like, uh, oh, they're kind of, that's nice. They're actually cards that you can use. You could cut them out and put them in sleeves, I guess. But they're cards that actually have, on the back, they have like a little, it's like a card of the character sheet, uh, which is nice. Everything from Knights of Gore to Breton Mercenary Knights. 
Um, and then also one of these is how what to do with a little card for uh, rallying the division, clash of champions, capturing banners, stuff like that. So um, stuff that you would do um, in battle. So pretty cool, but the, those cards are pretty handy. Um, the appendices, and then the, the others are these um, pre-gen characters. Like I said, there's no character creation, but they have pre-gen characters, which is sort of this a trifold. Uh, it's got a one-page one picture of the character, and then a trifold inside of, um, that you can access and use. I would probably, they look like you could write on them, but I would probably print these out for my characters somehow. I don't know if I would trifold it. I have to look at the PDF to see how you do this, but it has their characteristics, all their skills, um, their horses, their combat skills, and then their traits, passions, etc. All in like one like fold out. You can look at everything. And on the back, the, the back of history and events when they were born, squire and knighted, um, their passive glory sources, history and events, and then um, sort of a little bio on one of the flaps. Uh, so Sir Clarion is the first one we look at. His heraldry, gules, border, argent. So it's a, um, the border is silver, and the main thing is a big red, uh, just red. Uh, he's Simric Christian from Riddichan. Interesting. Oh, Riddichan. I'm just very curious. Oh, I wonder if they let you try to make your own land. That'd be pretty interesting. Riddichan is where the famous Earl of Riddichan in my story. That was his earldom. Maybe it's a lawless land in this incarnation as well, and the characters can strike out and make a kingdom for themselves or earldom, whatever. So, so yeah, so that's the Pendragon starter set. It looks like a whole game, really, um, except for character creation, uh, and really the source material is Lamortha, Arthur, and other Arthurian tales. So, uh, do you really need that? Anyway, any a big fluffy book? You probably do for like you know, gazetteer type stuff and and the like. So I'm looking forward to the sixth edition book. Um, but the starter set is a good starting point. Anyone want to play? All right. I usually don't talk about myself in this podcast. I'm pretty private. Some of you know my situation and are really good friends. It's been a tough year for me. I was uh, let go from my previous company after being there for about a year. And before that, I was furloughed during COVID. I didn't make the cut. They were dropping a lot of people at the university. Uh, interestingly, I still have an adjunct professorship at the university, so I can go there and uh in theory, teach classes, work in a lab, volunteer in a lab, use the library facilities, go to seminars, but they don't get, I don't get paid. I'd have to figure out my own funding source, but you really can't apply for grants as an adjunct professor. So I'd have to hook up with a professor there to um, work in their lab and generate some data and do that. So, and I hadn't, because I honestly, I only learn now how many, what kind of privileges I've had through happenstance um, and something that really almost you know, really upset me a few weeks ago um, what happened. Uh, someone had falsely, I'd applied for a job, I'd gotten the interview done well, um, it had, um, I'd gotten a letter to report to a job, did some background check stuff, and during the course of it, um, I guess the client of, it was a, a government contract job, the client um, for the recruiter said, no, we don't, we don't like you, and the reason they gave was a performance and eth or ethical behavior. And I'm like, what? So I kind of probed further and and the recruiter, although they've since backtracked, um, said, oh, well, someone said that I did something unethical. And that kind of pissed me off because I never have, never falsified data. But someone saying that is kind of a stain on your reputation. And, you know, we're working to try to resolve that, get the actual background report, see what it says and see if we need to take any other steps. But uh, when I called, well, they, and it got escalated, so I called the university, and there's nothing in my file, and it was, es it was so, so they were flabbergasted, needless to say. It was escalated to my old department, and then to the vice president of faculty affairs, who gave me a call, 
And so, no, you were actually never terminated. It's just a business decision. Uh, you still have privileges at the university, et cetera. So that was good. And I, you know, you, when something like that happened, you're like, at least for me, I got paranoid and like ever not to get me type of almost victim, well, victim mentality. And it was not the case. So that is a good thing. And in the future, I probably plan to be more engaged at the university, uh, which is kind of nice. But in a way, this was a blessing in disguise because I did, you know, I had another prospect. And then I was thinking, okay, well, what I might have to make a choice here. But the choice, in a way, was made for me. So now I work with a Fortune 500 company, which I've never done before. I feel like I've always w worked for Bush League or minor league uh, institutions. Um, as much as I love the university, well, they're not they're not a tier one institution. I mean, sure, they get a lot of grant money, but it's not like they're Harvard or you know Southwestern in Dallas or Houston or medical medical school in Houston. So, or U University of Texas, Texas A and M. They're not like that. In any case, and then the other company was really Bush League, but you know I'm working with a Fortune 500 company. I'm working. Uh, it's going to be totally different what I do um, from what I've done before, not science, but um, something that can actually really, I believe, strongly help people, more financial services, and I'm working on going back to school and getting licenses and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, I'm pretty excited. Um, it's been a challenge for sure. You probably don't want to hear that. You want to hear about gaming, but... Uh, kind of some of you are really my friends so why not why not share um in any case i think things are getting better and i'm not as down in the dumps you may see me as testy and a little angry and short views um and volatile and i apologize but um but maybe like i said things are on the up and gaming has helped uh, gaming has really sustained sustained me because i'm good at it um I guess I'm also good at Wars of Warcraft and apparently Royal Match. So, um, yeah, my three great claims to fame so far. Oh, no, that's not true. I have a pretty good publication record, actually. And I've gotten some damn good grants. So, uh, so yeah, so here's a, it's a turnaround for me. And really neat. Uh, on the way to work on Monday while well, I was listening, uh, no, yeah, before I listened to Joe Richter's latest podcast, you know, uh, or on the way back, I think on the way home after my first day at work, um, I learned that was March 18th, that March 18th in 1974 was when Rush released their debut album, self-titled album, Rush. And of course, the, the biggest song from that is Working Man. So the they played Working Man on the radio. You know, I get up at 7 a.m., go to work at 9. Got no time for living, yeah, because I'm working all the time. So, uh, yeah. Seems to me I could live a life a lot better than I used to be. That's why they call me. They call me the working man or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. All right. Let me give you a brief pause. That was cathartic. And we'll talk about games. <laughs> As a preface to this, I don't know if I'll come to any profound conclusions, but just off the bat and off the top of my head, I think, you know, why are these games sustainable or, or why have these games gone on for so long? Um, what might be issues in the game or create obstacles to continue or sustain the game? I guess those are the questions I want to answer for myself. Maybe you, the listener, can help me to answer them. So I'll probably go... Probably the easiest thing to do is to go like in order of the week. Um, and I'm just talking about the games that I run. All right, another game that has been a, sustainable for a long time has been the Reaver game that I play with Joe Salvador and we're playtesting his Reaver system, which should be out in a Kickstarter near you uh, this spring. So that's been sustainable too. And I think that's driven mainly by the need to playtest the game, go through various iterations. Joe's a great world builder, fantastic GM. I'm very particular about my GMs. There are only a few that I would is it trust. I don't know. I do have trust and control issues, as you might know if you played with me. 
Uh, but um, not as a GM, usually. Actually, I'm pretty pro player. I'm player forward as a GM. But as a player, I don't know. I don't like to lose. Maybe that's the main thing. I don't like to lose. So, um, so yeah. So, you know, it's really fun. Rebirth been awesome. Joe's great. Um, I totally trust him as a GM. So uh, there are a few of you out there. I'm not going to name everyone because I'll probably miss some of that I love and I played in your games and I really enjoy them. Um, and that's why I play in your games because, you know, I trust you as a GM. Um, so, all right. Maybe I'm sharing too much. But anyway, so Traveler. Traveler is the first game I run. been running that for over a year. I've actually, we started last January, January 2023. And it's gone really well. I do like Traveler. And we're in the middle of a murder mystery. It's definitely had been hit recently. Like I said, I've been up and down um, emotionally. So, I, you know, and things happen when you're like that. So, such that games get canceled, scheduling, right? Especially during the holidays gets difficult. But it's been pretty good and consistent. What I appreciate the most is a player engagement. Uh, we have players who like to do the trade. We have another player who likes to design the ships. Um, and then another player who really gets into the role playing and aspect, or maybe more than one of those. We have three players right now. Uh, there is a able and willing crew sort of a stable of NPCs that someone could take on as a PC if they so chose to join us Mondays at 7 Central. But you could make your own player because it's fun to make a player and traveler. And then you could join us after the murder mystery and some other things. On using, I'm doing running through action aboard the King Richard as a classic FASA adventure. And uh, after that, I'm going to do something kind of cool. One of the players has really wanted to get into sort of the Lore of the Ancients, so we probably will run um, a campaign. Right now, we've been just kind of just jumping from adventure to adventure. Sometimes it's an actual published adventure or rehash of an earlier adventure from the classic Traveler days, uh, like this one, particular one. But they've strung together in no particular order, and there's been a, some. I think sometimes when you get to a world and shit happens, so um, adventures are kind of come from that. And a couple of those led to i think there's going to be a change in the sort of tone of the campaign because the, the players actually have earned uh, the right to become knighted uh, through their actions so it should be pretty neat that you know right now they're like feel like they're probably fish out of water um as they're on this luxury liner with a lot of really rich people and they're they're good they're wealthy they're not you know behind in their mortgage they got some money coming in they're trying to improve that, and then becoming nobility can really, uh, really improve that. So you don't have to worry about how you're going to get uh, the mortgage for your ship, the ne your next paycheck, uh, et cetera. How are you going to pay the mortgage for your ship and get the next paycheck? That's what I had to say. So, uh, so yeah, so I think it's, it's really good. It, it's definitely viable. I hope to be playing for years to come because it's, it's just an ongoing thing. And I know I might pause or do time jumps uh, depending on what I want to do at one of my favorite eras right now we're kind of 1105 I don't I think we're like even though it's been a year of play a year and a few months of play I think we're maybe just hitting halfway with 1105 maybe not even that I don't know it's been a it's been a co uh, good quote-unquote year for these folks um in their 1105 third imperial year third imperium imperial year and um we'll see where it goes from there I'm, my favorite era um in the official traveler universe is kind of the rebellion era or second civil war more ap should more accurate actually which starts uh, about 10 years from now 1105 so um i don't know if i'll time jump it i don't know what i'll do with that um, a mega traveler is kind of my nostalgia when it comes to traveler. I always love the skill test system that they developed, but I do like Mongoose Traveler a lot. Uh, the combat is a lot slicker than in previous editions. Uh, the mega traveler combat was weird uh, in some places, especially ship to ship combat. Um, but then maybe again, maybe I just wasn't. I should reread it and see if there is nuances that I missed. Being you know in my twenties or so when I first played it. 
So yeah, so it's Traveler. It's done really well. The next game I'm going to talk about is Twilight 2000. That's our sort of cheese day every other. And it's gone for almost two years. Wait, is it two years? I think it might be... Let me try to figure this out. I think it was... Yeah, it'll be almost two years, um, which is pretty, pretty cool. I yeah, almost two years, I believe, in July, because I ran like the first time on my birthday, and we've done really. If it's three years, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Yeah, I guess I can't find where it says when this game started, but it's at least two years old, and I think the main reason it's continued is because. My wife Amy plays with me in the game, or is one of the characters in the game, and she really likes the game. So I think there's a common theme here. It's that the players are engaged and like the game, then the game will be sustained. <laughs> Maybe that's sort of self-evident. Um, but yeah, we're it's really cool, too. I, I do enjoy it. Um, I know if you talk with Amy, she probably talks about Twilight 2000 a lot and brings it up a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, she enjoys the game, which I think is very neat. Um, we have currently, we've had like a rotating cast of players, uh, but right now we have uh, four players, which I think is a, a good uh, number. They have a main, and they also run, I mean, they have a platoon-sized group. Maybe it's even a company-sized group. I think it's a company-sized group by now. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, they're applying in central Poland, um, doing, I guess, domain level stuff. So we would, we played through, we played, we started the Battle of Kalitz, um, so the classic uh, you're on your own uh, scenario, and then they made their way to Krakow, and we've been able to do sort of the tetralogy of Free City of Krakow, Pirates of the Vistula, Black Madonna and about to conclude the ruins of Warsaw. Um, yeah, it's it's been really good. We will I will probably have like a time gap. I don't know. There is a we I did a scenario that I kind of was inspired by the Black Madonna, especially the new iteration of the Black Madonna by Free League, and uh, it um, it inspired me to run like a, a one shot at a I think it's BSRCon. Yes, or Kong 2, and uh, that went really well, but it kind of has informed a bit of the campaign, so I don't know if we're going to have like a winter war between Krakow and Cilicia or not, but I think uh, Amy wants to have her character and one of the NPCs try to mitigate or prevent that conflict, so I don't know if that'll be after or before the time jump or kind of as a montage during the time jump, because I'd like to jump you know, about six months ahead um, from, you know, when they finished this here in probably early October, they finished the ruins of Warsaw, get back to Krakow, and then time jump to the spring or so of uh, 2001, and then go from there. There might be a split in some of the group, um, and we might, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be fine, honestly, to go to, like, weekly Twilight 2000. One week, we do Europe. The other week, we do U.S., because... The price. I don't know if there's some players who want their characters to do so, but it's, with the amount of people in the group, there's definitely probably some who want to see what happened in the U.S., some of the U.S. Uh, soldiers that are there. And there's a whole group of Marines now that probably want to go home, uh, led by a couple of NPCs who are former players. So they might want to go home too. So, uh, so we'll see. Um, there's a whole series of going home. You could stay in Europe and kind of do your own thing. There's a lot of fan made through free league um stuff where you stay and do things in central poland but that there's also like a going back to europe series that happens uh, later um and, and we probably just do our, but most of these adventures are not really like a linear adventure it's like these are the bad guys in this area this is what they want to do when we stop them that's kind of the way that that goes so i think that's a great it's a really fun outline of an adventure, really, um, not a traditional adventure, and more of a sandbox. And these are this is kind of the hex crawl, and what are you going to run into? So I think that's a great 
uh, kind of a cool thing to do um, in a game like Twilight 2000. So that's going on. I don't foresee it um, ending unless Amy and I really get into an argument, a strong argument about the game, which we do argue about it, but uh, nothing that threatens the game itself. Oh, as an added note, you can follow along our adventures on our YouTube channel. So Amy is my producer in the YouTube channel, and we've had some cool um, cool and popular, relatively speaking, uh, YouTube videos recently, including the latest one, Can You Have Romance, or Is There Romance in the War, or something like that. So I think that's, that's pretty neat. It's different. So um, next, uh, pa uh, Pathfinder. So we've been running two Pathfinder, Pathfinder Wednesdays, and I've been running Abomination Vaults and Kingmaker, alternately. And we have uh, three players in Abomination Vaults, four players in Kingmaker. Um, it's only a difference of one player. Uh, I, player, if you're listening, um, well, anyway, we could use another player in Abomination Vaults. So then we, I think that player scheduling doesn't allow them to play in ABV. Uh, we also do it on Fantasy Grounds, which can sometimes be an issue, especially if you haven't played for a while. I'm not as savvy with Fantasy Grounds as I am with World 20. So, um, uh, yeah, that's there's that issue. Um, I have played around with Foundry for Walking Dead, which has a neat Foundry, and I've played on Foundry um, the guys at BSRCon um, who are on BSRCon a lot like, like Foundry. So I played on Foundry. And there's some neat modules uh, for Foundry, but I guess I'm comfortable with Roll20. Uh, um, but Fantasy Grounds has some neat features, and especially now, man, you can adjust. In the latest in the latest update, you can adjust the camera so you can see from the point of view of your token on the map, um, which is very interesting. You can finally ping. Um, so, yeah, it's getting, you know, it's got some features. The um, sort of the, the automatedness of Fantasy Grounds is pretty cool too so anyway so we played uh abv on fantasy grounds and we actually played last night got through a couple rooms um but i i don't know i just think it's just hard that wednesday for some reason has suffered from a lot of misses and i don't know what the deal is maybe i'm not as excited and that could be a reason too i'm not as excited with pathfinder um but i do want to complete abomination vaults i really do like it um, and just things come up on Wednesday. Maybe it's a hard day, uh, middle of the week. People got kind of tired from work. Um, then Kingmaker, we've actually finished the first book. If you kind of go back to think about the old Kingmaker and Pathfinder 1, uh, Stolen Lands was the first book, and it concludes when you you beat this uh, bad guy named the Stag Lord, and, and then after that, start at the beginning of the second book, you start your domain. You start your your settlement and you start building your kingdom so we're in the kingdom phase and i that i feel like the last couple or two sessions not the last session the last session was a nice exploration a traditional way we've been running it and um but the two sessions before that were just really dragged to me maybe i was low energy but um the domain play on it it might be better to do it offline not in a game session the kingdom turns and stuff like that I'm not sure yet. Uh, I know that actually another person who runs a game, well, then on the Dungeon Musings channel, you, you learn, you might learn if you watch the Dungeon Musings Kingmaker stuff, they switched to Savage Pathfinder. Um, and I, I guess the, he said the players weren't really into the domain play and kingdom building. Maybe that was a reason. I'm not sure. Uh, it'd be cool to talk to him about that, compare our Kingmaker notes, maybe have to get him on again. Um, it was really fun to do the murder mystery. So yeah, so um, so I don't know. Um, I do like Kingmaker. I'd love to finish these things, but I'm just I need to wrap my head around it. Maybe maybe prep a little more. Um, I I read these adventures. Uh, read them, you know, read the adventure cover to cover, but maybe close to the time when they're there, go on, play with new features, especially on fantasy grounds or in Kingmaker, kind of have a plan uh, for the players. Uh, I think that's a lot of it. It's like, what do you want to do? Because it's really open-ended. It's just very much of a sandbox Kingmaker is. ABV is just a dungeon, straight dungeon crawl. Um, we go out of the dungeon and 
craft things, but go back in the dungeon to try to solve the problem. So, uh, so maybe with ABV, and I did propose to start a little earlier, so maybe that'll help too. So it usually takes about a half an hour for us to get settled, um, talk about you know bullshit for about a half an hour, and then get into the game. So we can be more focused. I think that will help as well. I save the best for last, I think. And the other game that is almost, is it almost three years? Potentially, it's almost three years in. And we have been playing Warhammer Fantasy. This is our second. For me, this is actually the third full campaign with different iterations of Warhammer Fantasy. So I run, um, I ran Thousand, Thousand Suns, Thousand Thrones, sorry, which was the second edition adventure that we started with second, but then rolled over into the third edition of Warhammer Fantasy. I've stopped and started with the Enemy Within a couple times with the first edition. Um, second edition had a trilogy that was like the Enemy Within, um, and then there was an Enemy Within in the third edition that we kind of bounced off hard. But in the fourth edition, which I really enjoy this incarnation of Warhammer, and I get very defend. I'm going to put it right now. Now I get very defensive when people criticize it because it's like, you know, I play with with like my best gaming friends, my home group, and I feel like when you're cutting on that game, I don't care if you cut on me, but you cut on them, and then I get defensive and sometimes argumentative about it. So really, if you haven't played it, don't believe what people say about it. You should play it. And I, we've recently converted. I mean, look on the Dungeon Musing channel. We recently converted quite a few people, Kevin and I, to Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, there are some people on there, of course, that you know you preach into the choir. Uh, some of his players that really love it, but but you know, it's a good game. It's a solid game. They've. I feel people say, oh well, you know, you have all this meta currency that makes it easier. Man, there, I can't tell you how many fights we've had where the characters are like, like winning by the skin of their teeth, definitely have scars to prove it. And, uh, and it's pretty amazing. You know, it's really boils down to like a lucky, a lucky crit, um, or, or something. And, uh, and I think that's, that's pretty neat. So and also they've cleaned up character progression, um, yeah, I think it's a challenge for a GM, and you have to kind of play to you and cater to your players. But our players that now in the enemy within campaign are like on the fourth tier of their career. Some of them, uh, they're movers and shakers in in Middenheim and in the central um, central empire. So, so they're they're a big deal. Uh, one of them is a champion of Middenheim. Um, so. One of them is a powerful amber mage and knight in the knights. Is it? It's not knight's panther, but he's definitely one of a knight in a knightly order, or has been, you know, uh, petitioned to become part of a knightly, knightly order. I mean, one is an inquisitor, like full on inquisitor, and uh, one has his own dueling school. One owns a, a small fleet of ships, apply the Reich. So yeah, it's a powerful group. And it's been really amazing. And I think maybe, again, maybe this is self-evident as we talk about sustainability in these games. We get together every week. We share a meal. We're friends. We do things outside of the game. Uh, the other, I, I can't meet on Mondays, but the, the group meets to play board games on Mondays, some of them. So, uh, you know, and it's great that we hang out. And I think that helps. Um, sometimes not all the sessions are fantastic. Uh, but some of them are super memorable. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, we've really enjoyed Warhammer Fantasy, and maybe that's what, like I said, maybe it's self-evident in conclusion, maybe it's self-evident that sustainability in the game is the relationships you have with the players. That's what keeps us sustainability in the games. So, so saying that, uh, I hope to keep some of these games going with my friends who I play with and enjoying this hobby that we all share so much. So, well, one big diatribe monologue, whatever you call it. Not a, not big rants. Just don't touch, don't touch my Warhammer Fantasy, um, or my Traveler, or my Pathfinder, 
on my Twilight 2000. So, uh, so yeah, I hope there's games on the horizon to get to this level of sustainability. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop me an email at geomologist at gmail.com. You can send me a voice message as well. I have a SpeakPipe account, but the easiest way seems to be uh, through Discord, and you can uh, record a message and then drop it there. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm starting my new career here at the ripe old age of 53. Um, I'm working with, a, like I said, a Fortune 500 company, so it's, a, it's kind of daunting. It's a lot of work. Um, I hope it doesn't impact my gaming, but it might. But gaming is kind of sacred to me, so it definitely it's in the schedule. Right. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, TJ Drennan, for the intro and outro music. The little incidental music is provided through Looperman, which you pay a um, subscription or get on as it has a free subscription, free loops and samples, Looperman Pro Audio Resource and Musicians Community, where you can get free samples um and then if you like the full thing you purchase the full thing so anyway it's a cool service i've provided and then the cover clip art my wife amy does a cover clip art and i think that's it so good night and good rolling